Or just take, take the MK party. You, you can't say, you can't say, I, remember, I remain a member of the ANC, but I support a party which is going to campaign to defeat the ANC. That doesn't make sense. One of those two things is wrong. So in terms of these breakaways from the ANC, take, take that breakaway. Uh, you can understand that. Uh, it is led by the same people who tried to destroy SARS. It's exactly the same people. This is exactly the same people. So you can understand who they are. The Zono Commission says, in terms of all of the evidence that we've received, one of the things that stands out is that the President of the Republic made certain that he was one of the leading people in terms of the SARS processes and in terms of the ESCOM processes. It's in the Zondo Commission report, it's in the public domain. And yet again, we have this strange phenomenon. Comrade President, that what I'm now saying about what the Zondo Commission says about who was responsible for this attempt to destroy science includes the President of the Republic. That is new news. It isn't. The, uh, and of course, you know who the president was. <laughs> uh, and it says so in black and white, Jacob Zuma was part of the leadership in the process of destroy science. <laughs> That's not my opinion. I'm telling you what the Zondo Commission says. Yeah. I'm telling you what the Zondo Commission says. Now, that's a bit of a conundrum. Um, that you would have the President of the Republic of South Africa participating in a process to destroy the institution that gives him the means to govern. That's a kind of contradiction. It's a contradiction that then raises a question. Who indeed is this president? Because there is no way you are going to be able to square the circle that the President of the Republic of South Africa acts to destroy the South African Revenue Service. I, that the Zondo Commission is entirely wrong, or we are dealing with somebody who is entirely wrong. <laughs> yeah. I'm saying, colleagues, that I think this is part of the process of the understanding of what Andres describes as age one and age two. And what happened during these two ages, which are opposite to each other. I think many of us in the room, are, perhaps with the exception of the panelists, are old enough to remember when we first had our first national power cut when the country went blank because of ESCO, what is called load shedding, the national. The first time it happened was in January 2008. You remember that even the mines, the mines had to shut down for a whole week. 
Uh, again, apart from, from our panelists here, yeah, uh, the older people would remember that uh, at that time I was president. And the previous month of December 2007, either December or November 2007, I'd, I'd apologize publicly. Because that, that what had been happening is that you had uh, regional instances of load shedding. Uh, so in November, December 2007, I apologized for that. I'm so on behalf of the government, we apologize for this because it's a re the reason for it is because there are certain things the government should have done and did not do. We delayed, and hence this apologies to the nation. I repeated that in the State of the Nation Address 2008. You can read it up. It's on the internet. So National Power Card, January 2008. Many, many years later, I read in the newspapers that uh, there's a report that has leaked which discusses the power failure of January 2008. And in reality, I was very wrong to apologize. Because what, what ESCOM did, what as the practice within ESCOM at the time, was that it had its own internal monitoring process about internal performance of the power stations. And the regulation was that each power station must have a minimum of 22 days, 22 days supply of coal immediately with it, uh, and not to go below that. So the internal monitoring system kept an eye on that. And already during December 2007, that monitoring system was telling the power station managers, you are running out of coal, replenish. And they didn't. What caused the power failure of January 2008 was the power stations ran out of coal. Because the power station coal managers at each station didn't respond to this alert from within this organization saying replenish. They didn't run out of coal, so you can't produce electricity in a coal fired power station without coal. I think I'm saying I saw this thing in a report in a newspaper. It was a leak. So naturally, as you'd imagine, I'm very interested in all of this. This was a leak from a, a report of a special investigation unit. There was an SIU that had been commissioned to study certain things at ESCO. That SIU reported to the president in 2017 and said what I'm saying, that the reason for the power failure in January 2008 was easily avoidable. All we needed to do was to replenish the coal supplies at the power stations, that's all. The SIU report says, but they didn't do it, for whatever reason. That, that SIU report was never released publicly to, the, to this day, it's still not been released. But I, as you would imagine, I, I have some friends in high places. <laughs> <laughs> so I asked them, I said, look, I've read in the media that there's such an SIU report 
and it's in the office of the president. Can I please get a copy? And they gave me a copy. And indeed the report says what I've just said. Now, colleague, I'm, I'm, maybe I'm talk, talking, tell, talking too long, but I'm trying to talk about 30 years of democracy. Question was raised very legitimately about ESCO. I'm saying the first national power failure at ESCO had absolutely nothing to do with the narrative that is told. No, this was failure of government. This, you know, it had nothing to do with failure of government. It was a deliberate decision from within the organization to produce that crisis. And one of the immediate consequences of that is, according to the procedures at ESCOM, they declared an emergency. An emergency meant that uh, in terms of coal, for instance, you didn't have to put out tenders and all of that. You just go and buy coal where it is available. That immediately doubled the price of coal. Immediately. And that report will also say some of those station managers pocketed something from that. I'm giving you, colleagues, an instance of part of what has been happening. I'm saying the, what the Nugent Commission particularly alerted us to, that there were some people in this country who did not like this democracy and sought to act in a negative manner to weaken it. I'm talking about ESCO. We take a decision, the government takes a decision in 2004. Whereas we had been saying to ESCOM, look, don't build new capacity, generating capacity, for a number of reasons. We changed that and said 2004, okay, please build. That's when the decision was made to build Kusile, Medupi, Ingula, these power stations. 2004. But the record will tell you that the construction of Midupi, the first one, the first one to go under construction, started in 2007. So the question that arises in my head, what's the delay? Decision takes get taken in 2004, Implementation starts three years later. Why? It's not easy to find an answer to that question in terms of 